Today, we're going to talk about why does time speed up as you get older, or why do we think it does, and why does it feel like time was so much slower when we were little kids? You know, I, that, it's always interested me because as a kid, you are told that's the truth. Like, when you get to high school, your mom is like, you were just a baby. Like, what happened? You know? And I remember being five and summer break from, like, kindergarten or whatever I was doing felt like forever. I, I thought school would never start again. And then it just, and it keeps going. And like high school is like so amazing and it kind of feels like forever. And then you go to college and your mom's crying. And, and then like Uncle Bubba or whatever is like, these are the best years of your life. <laughs> you're going to blink. You're going to be 50. You're going to be divorced twice and have six pit bulls. This is the best years of your life. Don't forget them. Pay attention and have fun. And so I'm like, okay, what a, I, that sounds terrible. Um, <laughs> I've already peaked out. I just got here. And so from that like moment of going to college and then moving on, I've always kind of been aware of this thing of like, are these the best years of my life? Am I peaking out? Like, I'm too young to peak out. And, <laughs> and so I spent my 20s, as like most people do in their 20s, kind of figuring out what you're good at. I graduated college. I went to law school thinking I would be a lawyer. I tried that for a minute, then moved into documentary filmmaking. And in my 20s, I'm just kind of figuring it out. All of a sudden, I'm like, you know, I'm having these amazing experiences learning, but then I see 30 coming. I'm 27. Well, I was. And I'm like, <laughs> and I'm like, oh no. 30 is like adult. And I'm supposed to know who I am by then. And I'm figuring that out. This is a problem. I need to, you know. And so I decide that. So in, in my 20s, I'm kind of learning that what I love is writing. And I want to be a writer, but I'm working in this amazing nonprofit. I'm liking it. But I'm seeing myself kind of work my way up the chain of that career. And I'm like, do I, do I want to do this forever? Will I regret? Will I suddenly have been in this career and be, and be 60 and realize I never wrote a book? I never like did that thing I dreamt. Am I going to regret that? And so at 27, I thought, okay, when I turn 30, I'm going to quit my job and go on like an adventure. And that way, I'll at least like take a year off. I can go back to my career, but at least I'll have tried. I'll go on this adventure and I'll write a book about it. And so that was what I did. And I did, um, I decided to do 10,000 miles in, from Oregon to the bottom of South America, uh, Patagonia, which is like so beautiful. And what, what's so interesting about this is I was 30 when I started, and yet I, this trip, which was 16 months, felt like an entire lifetime, like a new childhood. I, it, it was also very, sim it mimicked childhood. I didn't really remember how to ride a bike. I hadn't done it since I was a kid, so I crashed a lot. And I mean, it's like, you never forget, but that's like a total lie. And <laughs> especially if you clip in, like for any of you, like, yeah, it is like, scary. And then my, everything I own is on this bike, and so it's heavy. And I'm going south, and I don't speak a word of Spanish. I can hardly count to 10. And I'm going into Mexico, and, you know, it's pretty, you know, I'm learning. You, you, you can eat that, but not the way it comes. <laughs> and, you know, and you're just discovering this world again. And it is so, I mean, I basically learned to speak again. You know, I'm, I mean, I can, I, my Spanish is still rubbish, but I can speak like a toddler, you know, just like mine, hungry, poo-poo, whatever. <laughs> and, but I can get what I need to say across, which is, you know, great. So I experienced this amazing stretch of time changing. I saw things I didn't know existed, and I just kind of felt wonder again, like a kid. And so, but during this trip, 16 months, I felt a lot of um, homesickness because at 30, you've already made a great community. And I'm like, my friends and family are moving on without me. I'm experiencing this crazy thing, and they must have changed too. And But what's so weird is I thought I was gone forever. I come home, and some of my friends were like, you're back? You, you just left. And you know that scene in Contact where she goes through the wormhole and talks to the aliens, and then no one believes her? I was like, I have been gone forever. What are you talking about? They they had been in their routine and in their life and they didn't perceive what I perceived as this like incredible expanding sense of time. And that was made me, that, that made me very curious is like, 
why? You know, what made that happen? And so I started kind of researching it and figuring out why. One of the main things, and I'm not a researcher, I'm not a scientist, but I read a lot. And so I'm, and I'm alive and we all are alive. So this is interesting. So I'm going to like give you some things that I learned about it and see how it applies. Cause I want to know why my 30th year felt like my teenage years again. Proportional theory is interesting. It's this idea, you might have heard it, where when you're a kid, proportionally, a year is much more of your life than when you're old. If you're five, one year is 20% of your life. So that's, it takes a long time for Santa to come again. It's like 20% of your life. And you're like waiting. Whereas when you're 80, it's 180th. Or you know, when, when you're 30, it's like around 3%. Or it's, it's just much less. So you would think that as, that kind of explains like as you get older, years become less per perceived with less value because of, it's sort of like gold. A few pieces of gold are valuable, but when you flood the market, they're less valuable. But that's not really true for me because I found that my 30th year was as valuable as my sixth year. So somehow I had tricked this into doing something else. In my research, I also found a fascinating thing about fear. Time seems to slow down when you're scared. You know, like if you've ever been in a car accident and everything is very slow and you're like, how is this happening? I, I remember I rolled a car off a cliff. Um, apparently I'm Wolverine. I was totally fine. But, and, and it was like our extra car. It was a terrible car. So the seat belts didn't work. The tires were bald. Why was I driving this car? And it fishtailed. It went off the thing. I'm bouncing around in the car. The airbags are like, wah, wah, wah. My head is breaking the glass. And I remember Tori Amos playing, beautiful. And I remember her singing and thinking as I'm falling down the cliff, how weird that she's singing this beautiful music as I die. Like, that's so beautiful, you know? And yet, I, like, it was maybe three seconds. How could I remember that? So the research shows that it's, you're actually not slowing down time at that moment. What's happening is your amygdala some part of your brain, is overproducing memories. So it's layering on more memories. So in times of fear, you have richer and deeper memories. And because the memories are so rich and deep, your brain perceives that as taking longer time. But it doesn't. And why your brain does that is because your brain marks important moments. It wants to study them. Like It's almost like when the CIA finds out that so-and-so went into a building, they go back and look for that tape and study that tape. You know what I'm saying? That your brain does that with important things. It studies tape. And so we grab onto these moments of fear. And that what's interesting is it's also existential fear. It's fear of who you're going to become. It's fear. It's worry. Your brain latches onto those moments. You think about the first time you moved to a new city. That first week felt like forever. And then all of a sudden, you'd been there a year. Because the first week, you're scared. You don't know where you're going. So your brain and everything is totally on as it's downloading information because it's marking it as important. The opposite of fear is routine and familiarity. So what happens is your brain doesn't want to be scared and it doesn't want to be turned on because it, like your muscles, like you, is lazy. And it doesn't want to do work. So it wants to establish a way to check out. And so once you find a way to fit into this world and not be so stressed, it goes, yeah, let's do that. Okay, earn your money, do this, like have a family. And, and that's all great and important. And it's important to have, th this is all like not a value judgment, but you know, like it's important to have a routine to create a safe space for a kid. But it comes at a cost in the sense of once you make a safe space, your brain maintains kind of like a stagnant line. It's not as turned on as it was, which comes at the cost of time feeling like it's slipping through your fingers. Um, so this one is so great. This is the return trip effect, which I loved reading about. So this is, have you ever noticed when you go somewhere and when you come home, you're like, that was way shorter, but it's like literally not shorter. So what they studied it is, is like, is that because of familiarity? Now you know the route. No, because they did a study where they had people go from point A to point B, but then they sent them a different way home, but it was equidistant. And they found that people still had the return trip effect. So what they found is that it's actually expectation and optimism. 
you're going somewhere, you're thinking about getting there, you're wondering how long it takes, you're coming around the bend and you're like, okay, maybe it's around this hill, oh no, there's another hill or whatever. So you're, you're aware of the journey and because of that awareness, you pay attention and because of that, time seems to s stretch. On the way home from the party, you're talking about the party, check it, post on your Instagram, not paying attention, you're home, bam, so you missed it. This is the thing that really explained a lot for me when it comes to why my bike trip felt the way that it did. The reminiscence bump. So when you interview people over many years, like as they get older and older, the, the ages of 15 to 25, people have richer, deeper memories in those years that they can recall for the rest of their life. And what they found is, yes, it has a lot to do with you're having a lot of firsts, your first kiss, your first heartbreak, first living alone, first sex, anything, you know, a lot of firsts when you latch onto that. But it's not just firsts, because if I ask you when was the first time you had a bowl of plain Cheerios, you don't know, <laughs> because you, you didn't care. It's firsts that are connected to identity, okay? This is what's so interesting to me. Those th we are all this like amorphous sense of like self. We have like a spirit or a soul or a brain or something going on that has, that knows what it likes and what it doesn't like only by testing. You listen to music and you like remember where you were when you heard like your favorite band for the first time. Like I remember the room I was in. These moments where my brain goes, oh, that's you. That's you, grab that. And then your memory, just like fear overanalyzes, your memory goes back to those moments of identity anchors constantly to reference with the type of person you are. And so because of all of these things are happening in succession between 15 and 25, you remember it as taking a long time and as very vibrant. And this is what's so interesting to me is that we think that youth is what was so great. But youth is actually just where we're see seeking out and finding our identity and figuring out who we are and having these experiences that go along with it. And so what I found is in my bike trip, I accidentally was doing these things that expand time. It's not about making time slow down because nobody wants to sit in the DMV forever. If you want to live a long time, you know, like go like have a crush on someone and wait for them to text you forever. You know what I'm saying? Like that is not what you want. You want to like expand time, make it richer and deeper. And so these seem to be, based on the research, the ingredients. Discovery, new experiences, but that are attached to identity. There's a great TED talk by a guy named Dan, Dan Gilbert. It's really short. And he talks about how we think that identity is something we arrive at and then we're there, we're done. But that's an illusion. People change their whole life. You're constantly discovering who you are. You're like, you're not like a pond, a stagnant pond that you just like find. You're like a river moving, changing on your way somewhere. And that is, it's not like a river is literally moving like one day it's on this side of a mountain the next day, but it's like slightly changing and it's going, you know, it's going somewhere. It's fascinating. And so knowing that, that you're never actually arrived to identity, you're always uncovering and then to pursue actionable steps in discovery of that identity, you'll continue to make these grounding uh, identity anchors, these memories that make time feel dynamic, rich, real. And then your life will be one constant peak after the next. And another way to engage in that is fear, which is really hyper alertness, doing things that stress you out, that challenge you, that knock you out of your comfort zone. What's so amazing is all of these things are cliches, but then like science, uh, like they're cliches for a reason because it's real. <laughs> but another important one, which is so interesting that learned th through the return trip effect is that it's optimism. When, you, when you're young, it's sort of like the return trip effect. When you're young, you're headed somewhere. You think you're gonna be somebody. You have these goals and dreams and you're paying attention to the road then you sort of arrive somewhere and maybe the party's not as cool as you thought, but you're like, Bleh. and then you just kind of stop paying attention. You're like, well, this is the cards I was dealt. And if you don't realize that if you pay attention to that journey and you see the optimism that you had as a kid, that you are still becoming, you are always becoming, that those memories will continue to anchor. I was 30 years old, I'm 33 now, and so like I have felt like I've continued to have this most dynamic, incredible life where 
if you ask me, I left in 2013 for this trip. If you ask me like, how long ago does 2012 feel? I would be like, mm, the Renaissance. Like what? I feel like one of like one of those uh, dr vampires. You know, they've lived 2,000 years and like they're, they're so calm because like they've seen everything. I feel, I feel that because I just have stayed so alert in these moments of pursuing identity. And now that I know what the ingredients are, 18 doesn't have to be the best years of your life. They keep coming when you keep turning the page on your identity and learning more about yourself and discovering how beautiful it is to still be becoming, that optimism of childhood. And that way, you're not a pond. You're a river. And when, when you make it to 80, when you make it to 90, God willing, and, you've, and that river pours into the ocean, it won't feel like a stop. It'll feel like, oh, I'm home and I'm exhausted. Thank you.